Since the late 19th century, Liverpool has been plagued by gangs. Gangs with names attached to them, gang fights, become more evident in the 1880s in Liverpool. But you do get more of a gang culture or a feeling for gang culture in the 1880s. Yeah. In this part of town, the fearsome cornermen claimed rule over the streets. <laughs> This is a map of the city back then. And this is Tithe Barn Street, running along here to the docks, with their huge berths all full of container ships. And up here, this is where our corner men would have hung out, wearing their trademark boots, their soles covered in deadly nails. The beatings they would hand out saw their notoriety soar and they soon became known as a menace not to be messed with. So they were violent, usually drunk and fairly disorganised. The opposite of the guy I'm looking into, Curtis Warren, born 1963. Unlike the cornerman Gary's looking at, this guy is full on. He operates on a much bigger scale. A drug baron in the Liverpool Mafia whose efforts made heroin and cocaine available to both rich and poor in every town in the UK. He rose from the street to make it onto not only the Times Rich list, but also onto the top of Interpol's list of most wanted men. Curtis Warren was the second son of a mixed-race seaman from South America who lived with his Spanish wife. Regarded as half-caste, he fell into neither the white nor the black gangs of the city and had to prove himself all the more. He grew up in the Granby area of Toxteth. There were alehouses, clubs, prostitutes and strip joints. Old West Indians in Panama hats smoked ganja. Women in saris ran stores. Hindus, Muslims, Rastafarians and Christians all mixed together. I'm here to meet journalist Graham Johnson, author of The Cartel and Powder Wars, who can tell me a bit more about Curtis Warren. So this is Toxteth, where Curtis grew up. Yeah. What was it like during those years? The drugs cartel started here 30 years ago, and this is where people like Curtis Warren and other cartel godfathers came from. What, these streets? Yeah, just around here, yeah. Now, the part of Toxteth, which are very gentrified, um, Lots of money has been poured into it. But then it was poverty stricken. It was one of the most deprived parts of Europe. So you had a lot, a lot of connections to the docks. But listen, they all closed down in the early 80s. Loads of jobs went, 25, 30% unemployment around here. So it all kind of accumulated into the riots. Yeah. Did that change everything? Yeah, it changed everything. It changed uh, the criminal landscape. The riots were really an uprising. They were caused by deprivation and kind of racist, heavy-handed policing. And this was effectively turned into a no-go area. The police didn't want to come in here because uh, it was difficult for them to mount patrols and there were lots of tension between the police and the local population. You had a lot of kind of alienated people who couldn't find work. And it was like a pool of unemployed foot soldiers who thought, well, if we can't work in the, in the legitimate economy, we'll work for the local drug dealers. It was kind of spun as a kind of... If you're doing this, it's a political act as well as a criminal act. It's kind of a rebellion against uh, mainstream society. Age nine, Curtis Warren would climb through small windows and burgle homes. By 11, he dropped out of school and was carrying out muggings and armed robberies. At 12, he was stealing cars. As a teenager, he progressed to selling heroin. In 1993, the police had just captured £40 million worth of heroin, the largest haul ever seized up to that time. But they had nothing other than a sighting of Warren to link him to the crime. From a young age, Warren had learned every trick in the book. Even though Warren was only 11 when he left school, he spent his teenage years being educated in crime. Whereas a student would go from school to university, Warren would graduate from Boston to prison. But unlike most criminals and students, Warren doesn't smoke, drink or take drugs. He has a photographic memory of numbers, telephone and bank account details. 
He never writes anything down. He frequently changes phones. He plans meticulously. The police knew they would need every help they could find to trap Warren. And their chance came when in the late 80s, Warren teamed up with a drug trafficker called Brian Charrington. Charrington would become a police informer. In 1991, he flew with Warren to Venezuela to set up a big cocaine shipment from the Cali cartel. Warren organized for the cocaine to be concealed in large ingots of lead. Just to give you an idea of the planning, the cocaine was shipped inside 32 lead ingots, this big. It meant that they couldn't be x-rayed, and to cut them open would take hours. It's also said that Warren knew the length of the drill bits that customs used, 25 centimetres long. Now just take a look at this. 25 centimetres means you can't get anywhere near the centre. It was with such ingenuity he made the Liverpool Mafia Britain's first and most successful drug cartel. When the ingots arrived in England, customs were suspicious. When they cut one open, they found nothing and let the shipment go through. Only moments later, they got a tip-off from the Dutch police, warning them that there was a cocaine shipment inside them. But it was too late. The ingots were already on their way to Liverpool. Inside was the cocaine. Warren's cup was an estimated 87 million pound. But even Warren's sixth sense couldn't predict that Charrington was informing the police. Now, at the same time, in another part of the operation, uh, one of Curtis Warren's partners, a used car salesman from Middlesbrough called Brian Charrington, he was informing on Warren. So, slowly but surely, the customs and excise were, were building a picture of, uh, of their target one. But drug money has a habit of corrupting every level. The case against Warren would collapse. Even though they connected him with the lorries, yeah. he walked free, right? The case against him was weak, and this was partly because there were complications to do with the supergrasses that were kind of involved in the case, particularly to do with this, his partner, Brian Charrington. There were allegations of uh, police corruption. There was a kind of murky involvement, uh, kind of higher up the chain involving MPs and the kind of Chan Lord Chancellor's office and so on. So anyway, the, the bottom line was that uh, the case didn't stack up. Warren got off, despite another supergrass testifying against him. Now, if anyone knows Kurtz Warren, it's this next guy we're going to see. It's Paul Grimes. Stood up in the dock, faced him, gave evidence against him, and is now known as a super grass. Paul has just texted me his number and his address, and we're off there now, so uh, we'll see what he's got to say. How did you uh, first meet uh, Curtis Warren then? I had a scrapyard in Greenland Street, South End, and he was... He was going round the little factories, demanding the money off people that worked in them and all this. And I comes back to the yard and the, the lad in that he was looking after, he said, this fella's been in, blah, blah, giving it worth four, he wants money. And he said, I couldn't give him none because we had none. I said, you don't give no one any fucking money out of my draw. Comes in, walked past me and my brother, went in the office and started giving it worth four. And I walked around and went, who the fuck are you, you little cunt? Yeah. I said, you don't come in here, demand the money off any fucking man. I said, I'm telling you now. So the next thing, I kicked fuck out of him, phoned him an ambulance and put him in an ambulance. And the next thing, he was in jail and he was on the drug scene. How did you get involved in that whole ingot thing then? Because I had this crap metal business. My brother was involved with the people that got involved with Warren. And he phoned me up to sell the ingots. After extracting the cocaine from the ingots, Warren had ordered his gang to bury the lead. But instead, some of them tried to sell the ingots to make a bit more money. When Grimes learned what had been inside the ingots, he informed customs. Paul Grimes gave evidence against Warren in court. He couldn't believe it when Warren got off. When they, all, they got necked and all that, he, he walked out to court yeah. because the customs fucked up on him. So were you worried about that? No. When he, when he walked free? No. That didn't bother me at all. I was still walking around. Tell you one thing that I did do though for a while, I carried the shotgun on with me. Mm. So I went off. It must have been a worrying time for you. At though. that time, yeah, for the yeah. first couple yeah. of weeks and all that, and then once it died down, that was it then. 
What made you uh, decide to bring him down? Because of him up there. Paul's son died a heroin addict. It hardened Paul's resolve to try and right some wrongs. He didn't mind crime, but he had no time for drugs. If he was doing what I was doing, robbing banks and all that, good luck to them. But well, once the drugs and my son died of the drugs, I didn't give a fuck who he was or who he was. I just have them in the story. And as I said before, I stood on over his grave and I said, I will get these people for you, and that's what I got. So we just come out of Paul's house, and there was one question in my head before we got there, and that was uh, why he turned against uh, Warren, and what gave him the kind of momentum to get up there in the stand and, and face Warren in court and become a supergrass. And I think when he told us the story about how his boy died on the drugs that they were bringing in, it all kind of makes sense. Um, I think any father would feel the same. I don't think, I think you stop caring about your own life and uh, you go after the person that you think killed your son. So I can understand it, it makes sense to me now. Warren had walked. Although Merseyside police had captured two huge shipments, they had missed Warren every time. In 1996, Curtis Warren relocated to Holland to a secluded and well-protected house in the quiet town of Sassenheim, lying between Amsterdam and The Hague. But this wasn't retirement. Warren carried out business as usual. The, the authorities decided that if they were to go after him again, they would have to kind of streamline the operation. And in this case, the Dutch authorities took the lead. Despite Warren's careful planning, there was one thing he didn't expect. In Dutch law, it's legal to wiretap without a warrant and use it in a court of law. The Dutch police were listening in to all of his activities. Time was running out for Curtis Warren. He was Interpol's target number one. By 1996, Curtis Warren was a very rich and powerful man. He stashed his money away in Swiss bank accounts. He's said to have owned over 300 houses in the northwest, mansions and office blocks in Britain, casinos in Spain, his villa in Holland, discos in Turkey, property in the Gambia, and even a vineyard in Bulgaria. He could have retired to a tropical island never to be seen again, but this was Curtis Warren. Another shipment was already underway. You know what fascinates me though is why didn't he stop when he had all the money, when he was sitting at the top, why did he go back to Holland and start bringing in more when he didn't have to? The whole thing is driven by vice, it's driven by greed, it's driven by a lust for power, which for me and you, it's difficult to kind of get our heads around it. And that's what it was. And I remember one of his best mates asked him that question, why are you doing this? And he said, well, it gets me out of bed in the morning, otherwise I'd be sat at home, you know, in my boxer shorts, watching Richard and Judy on the telly. This time, Cocaine from Venezuela was shipped to Bulgaria. On October the 24th, 1996, the consignment arrived in Holland. That night, Dutch SWAT teams raided Warren's home and a warehouse. And through a complex kind of undercover uh, surveillance operation involving wiretaps, they managed to catch him red-handed, bringing in uh, another superload of cocaine. He goes to trial. It stacks up and he goes to jail for, for a long time. The top five men in Warren's drug ring were among the ten men dragged from their beds and arrested. The police confiscated 400 kilograms of cocaine, 60 kilos of heroin, 1,500 kilos of cannabis and 50 kilos of ecstasy. Their street value, £125 million. Pounds. Simultaneously, British police searched premises across northwest England to arrest the gang's other cohorts. The Tithe Barn outrage sparked a public debate about gangs and street violence that pinpointed unemployment, housing conditions, punishment, police inefficiency, and lack of political will as root causes. Did people recognize that the poverty and the slums and the unemployment of Liverpool was what was really causing this trouble? 
Um, a bit later, in the 1880s, you start to get those um, views coming across. But in the 1870s, they were still seen as drunken, workshy scroungers. And it's from the 1880s onwards, you start getting efforts made by so-called do-gooders at the time to actually improve things. So you've got, you know, campaigns for edu education comes in 1870. Uh, you've got um, campaigns for better housing, um, temperance campaigns to save people from uh, drink, and also the, the rise of boys' clubs um, and early youth clubs. Yes. And that all starts coming in to start tackling this problem of young people hanging about on the streets and, and the violence and the binge drinking. Such violence sparked public debate that pinpointed unemployment, housing conditions and lack of parental control as root causes. They also blamed the rise of penny dreadfuls, cheap magazines glorifying the exploits of criminals. In the same way video games are blamed today, some things never change. Even though he was behind bars in a high-security prison in Holland, Curtis Warren didn't stop. On September the 15th, 1999, while in the exercise yard, he was attacked by another prisoner. Warren retaliated with such force, the prisoner was taken to hospital where he died. Warren was found guilty and convicted of manslaughter. In 2005, he was accused of running a drug smuggling cartel from his cell but the case was dropped because of insufficient evidence. Warren was released in June 2007 and returned to Liverpool. If he got out of jail, the first thing can, he's looking to do a deal, he's looking to do some graft, he's looking to link back up with his old mates. He's not looking to go straight uh, or he's not looking to kind of retire. And that's the problem really, you know, he's a, you know, he's a born criminal. In 2009, Curtis Warren was jailed once more after being caught trying to smuggle £1 million worth of cannabis into Jersey. Although he took all the usual precautions and used phone boxes, which are virtually untraceable, this time he was under constant surveillance. This time the authorities had the evidence. He's currently being held at Her Majesty's Prison, Full Sutton, where he serves a sentence of 13 years. But in the end, you know, I think crime is always the same, especially when you get involved in drugs. Uh, the people that you start to work with, even though you reach the top of your game, I don't believe that you can escape. I think once you're in it, you're in it for life. And I think that's what happened to Curtis Warren.